and um, final speaker of the session. Very much in the uh, continuing theme of of uh, the interaction between vision and action, and how we can be by action is Ricardo Stocchi from the University of Manchester, who is not going to talk about behavior and uh, behavior from vision, but about uh, <laughs> uh, pure motivation in my visual calibers or look up in the thousands. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be, to be here. Uh, and uh, like Silvia, I'm one of those uh, a lot of person who never actually met uh, uh, my plan. Uh, um, uh, but <clears throat> I hope uh, yeah, this can still be uh, interesting. So uh, I'd like to change the, the title of the talk to uh, include some of the uh, most uh, recent stuff that uh, we have been doing the, uh, in the lab. And um, I have to say, this is a, a title of this beautiful diversity of eyes. Uh, all this work is in uh, Islamic mouse. Uh, but what I hope uh, to, to give you is some uh, useful insights into a, a mouse perspective, okay? Uh, so as we, uh, as we all know, the, uh, <laughs> the visual world is, is complicated. Uh, and again, in, in spite of this uh, complexity, uh, it is also established that uh, natural scenes uh, share a number of common properties of uh, regularities. Uh, and one of uh, such regularities, for example, is the, <coughs> Is the relation between spatial frequency and the, and the power associated with these spatial frequencies, right? Uh, and uh, as humans, we uh, tend to uh, focus on the on the on the tail of this long tail distribution that we are very focused on the tiny little uh, details of the uh, of the scene that allow us to, for example, to manipulate things. Um, <clears throat> and this is also uh, reflected in uh, how our uh, visual system are, are organized. So, uh, for example, in, in primary visual cortex, we have uh, overwhelmingly uh, small uh, uh, receptive fields. So, uh, the question is uh, what about uh, low spatial frequencies, right? <clears throat> and, um, and what I want to tell you is that uh, really also low spatial frequencies can uh, provide uh, very useful information. And uh, indeed, a, a hallmark of uh, natural scenes. Is the, is the gradient of light intensity uh, along a uh, visual elevation. And uh, this is important because it allows us to uh, discriminate between different environments. For example, if we are in an open field, we will see that just above the horizon, the uh, light intensity increases quite sharply. Uh, while uh, if we are in a forest and we are uh, uh, shielded from the uh, direct uh, skyline, then uh, this, this gradient will be much more uh, shallow. So uh, here we uh, ask two uh, sort of very uh, basic questions. So, uh, how, uh, uh, if they do, uh, such pattern uh, guide uh, noise exploratory behaviors? Uh, and secondly, uh, which, uh, if they do, which photoreceptors are utilized to uh, capture this uh, feature? Uh, and to do that, we, uh, we used a, a, a LiDAR box, okay, a modified version of the LiDAR box. This, is, uh, this has been um, used for over 40 years in, in pharmacology, and, uh, and, um, uh, and the logic of this study is quite simple. So we have a, 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 an arena with two chambers, the animal can go uh, on, <coughs> on the bright side or on the dark side, and uh, mice tend to lie on the dark side. Uh, and in, uh, in our uh, lab, this is a bit more uh, sophisticated. So uh, around uh, uh, these uh, two chambers, we have a, a, a much bigger box that uh, the animal cannot access, but it acts as a, a, as a diffuser. So essentially it dampens down uh, low spatial, uh, high spatial frequency while uh, the low spatial frequencies are retained. And uh, we have a bunch of different uh, um, light sources that provide both uh, visible and UV lines. Uh, and they are uh, positioned at different heights uh, uh, around this big box. And, uh, and with this, we can recreate the natural patterns of uh, light intensity along visual elevation. Uh, and to measure that, we actually used uh, Dan, uh, Dan's meter, uh, which, is, uh, which is very neat. And, and essentially, we have a calibrated camera, uh, calibrated by Dan. And we take a, a, a bunch of pictures uh, in the natural scenes. 
and then these features are uh, sort of uh, rectified, uh, and finally averaging. And, uh, and uh, this averaging uh, essentially removes all the high spatial frequencies, but uh, preserves this uh, vertical gradient of light intensity. And, uh, and we use this uh, environmental light field method in, in two ways. First of all, to uh, acquire uh, <coughs> this, uh, this gradient of light intensity from natural scenes. And secondly, to uh, calibrate these gradients uh, in the lab. Uh, and with this, now we are ready to go. And the, the, the first uh, result that we obtained, uh, which was quite uh, exciting, was that uh, indeed uh, mice uh, do have a preference for specific patterns of elevation. So here you can see we have these two chambers. One is has a relatively constant light intensity uh, all along the, um, the elevation. And the other one has this uh, um, typical uh, natural pattern of <laughs> light intensity of the dark uh, 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 on the ground and the bright and the And uh, we also uh, did um, another bunch of tests. Uh, and one of those was uh, with, uh, with the two chambers with a relatively constant uh, gradient of uh, elevation. But in one chamber, uh, you can see the checkerboard. So we introduced uh, high spatial frequencies. And uh, what we find uh, is that uh, really mice do uh, like this uh, chamber one, so the, the natural one. Uh, and uh, instead, they don't really seem to care about uh, high spatial frequencies, for example, for these <coughs> uh, checker patterns. Um, and I think this is quite uh, interesting also if you think about the, the, the traditional light like, box test, where the, uh, where the illumination is more like this, uh, this constant illumination. Uh, and so that, that might actually explain why uh, throughout the years, which people kept getting uh, like often inconsistent results. And what is is that uh, maybe even if you you know if you uh, remove mouse anxiety, they will still uh, not look it to uh, the bright channel because they don't like it. Maybe they think it's stuck. It doesn't look uh, natural, right? Um, then we try to uh, deconstruct this a little bit more. So we. Uh, <coughs> We, um, we, uh, we we provided uh, you know different uh, gradient at different um, uh, uh, at different uh, levels of, uh, of elevation, and uh, what we find is that what uh, the mice really seem to care is the is the light intensity just above and below the line. So this is what really uh, seems to drive uh, the mouse uh, preference. Uh, and then uh, this takes us to the, uh, the second question. So, uh, which um, uh, photoreceptors are utilized to capture this uh, this pattern? Uh, and uh, as we know, uh, so so far I, I've been talking about light intensity, but of course there is also a, a spectral difference uh, along elevation. And this was uh, shown quite nicely, for example, by uh, uh, Euler Lab, um, that they showed that uh, so, uh, UV light. Is uh, disproportionately uh, higher uh, above the horizon uh, compared to green light, and uh, and this has a, this is also uh, reflected in, in the way uh, coronal photoreception is organized uh, at the laser of the retina. So uh, we know that uh, short wavelength uh, oxygens are uh, uh, more densely expressed in the, in the ventral retina like in <coughs> and the sky, and this is also the region where. Uh, we have cones that uh, can exclusively express this type of oxygen. Uh, and uh, conversely, in the inner retina, uh, we have uh, retina gradient cells that uh, express melanoxin, so they are uh, intrinsically photosensitive, and they are uh, they tend to be more dense in the, in the ventral retina, so looking at the, at the ground. Uh, so we did, uh, we used uh, certain Distinguish between these uh, these contributions. Uh, we use two uh, uh, type of mutated animals. So uh, one uh, one group had uh, no uh, uh, functional cone um, uh, phototransduction, uh, so it relied only on uh, rhodopsin and melanopsin, and the other had uh, no melanopsin transduction. <coughs> And uh, what we find is that when we uh, remove uh, cone signaling, the preference is still there. So uh, the mice don't seem to, so cone signaling might, might, might be used when they have it, but it doesn't seem to be uh, necessary for this, for this preference. Uh, and conversely, when we uh, uh, remove an 
to a signal and then um, you can see uh, down there then the, the preference is uh, abolished. So just to summarize this uh, <coughs> initial part, so uh, low spatial uh, low spatial frequency information, so in the form of uh, light intensity along the elevation, uh, guides mouse exploration and uh, so to allow the animal to choose the right, for example, the right uh, habitat. Uh, and um, comfort reception is not uh, necessary while uh, there are no symptoms to play uh, an important role. Right. Uh, and then, uh, of course, now. So far, uh, we focused on the uh, on the properties of the external environment, but of course, uh, as we as we uh, sort of shown uh, repeatedly and uh, very nicely throughout the previous talks, uh, like uh, our uh, visual input is also fundamentally determined by our own uh, actions, uh, and uh, and again, it was um, beautifully illustrated and also very accurately quantified in, in uh, my plant's lab. Um, and uh, and uh, and we also know uh, from uh, decades of uh, research that uh, information about our own action also enters the, uh, the visual system, for example, in the form of uh, proprioception or through color and previous charges or from the vestibular system. So there are a lot of ways in which we can uh, acquire information on, uh, about our own actions. Uh, so uh, understanding how information about our own action is integrated with the flow of visual processing. Uh, um, still today is, uh, is one of the fundamental uh, challenges I think, uh, uh, for visual scientists. And uh, this problem has also been uh, intensively uh, studied in, uh, uh, by using the mouse as a model system. And uh, we have been known now for uh, over a decade that, uh, um, for example, had the mice that run on a treadmill, uh, the, the firing rate in uh, uh, different uh, stages of, of the visual system can be uh, sometimes uh, dramatically uh, modified. And this has been shown uh, consistently in primary visual cortex, uh, like in the figure, uh, but also at earlier stages of visual processing, like, for example, in primary visual talons, and even at the level of retinal output, like uh, Sylvia has uh, shown us. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the limitations of, of those uh, studies uh, that I show you further is the fact that uh, most of them were performed in uh, head fixed animals, so they couldn't really express the, the whole range of uh, their natural behaviors and movements. Um, so, what we did here was to uh, to try to uh, understand how uh, postural movements are uh, can uh, enter the visual system, uh, specifically the mouse visual talons during a more uh, natural and uh, free moving uh, exploration. And so to do that, we, we did uh, uh, sort of simultaneous brain recordings while we uh, <coughs> were uh, performing sort of a 3D uh, reconstruction of the mouse uh, head and body. And uh, then we use this uh, 3D data to capture some of the um, to, to capture uh, a number of distinct behavioral variables that allow us to measure different uh, postures or, uh, or movements uh, of the animal. And uh, and with this, uh, we then we were then uh, able to um, uh, to measure the, the coupling between these behavioral values. And the neuron activity in pre-imaging animals, and in order to dissociate the sort of the, the <coughs> visual signal from this uh, uh, no visual information about uh, animal action, then we uh, initially we performed all these experiments uh, in the dark, uh, and you can see here a couple of examples here where uh, you can uh, kind of see that the, the firing pattern seems to. Uh, correlate uh, either with uh, specific uh, postures of, of the animal or with a novel state of, uh, of movement. So, and then we wanted to uh, quantify this more uh, systematically. So we uh, we used a, a bit of machine learning. So uh, we 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 did uh, a, a, a models that could uh, potentially predict. Uh, uh, neuronal firing rates 
based on the specific uh, behavioral variables. And then we uh, measure the correlation between predicted and measured fire rate. And, and that was our uh, measure of uh, uh, coupling. And, and uh, what we find is that um, actually a, 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 fair, a, a sizable fraction of neons, in, even in primary visual columns, are uh, at least to some extent uh, coupled to some uh, behavioral variables uh, in the bar. Right? Uh, and uh, sometimes the, 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 the size of this coupling was not, uh, was relatively modest. Uh, and I think part of it is because um, often neurons don't have a very high firing rate. So, uh, so they didn't have the dynamic range of uh, encoding uh, more uh, continuous variables. Uh, but this effect becomes uh, more apparent when uh, we put together uh, more and more units and we use this population fire rate to actually predict uh, particular process. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the first uh, uh, main results that we uh, obtain is that the, uh, the coupling between uh, postures and movements in the primary visual columns can actually be explained by a few variables. Okay, so uh, the important message here is that uh, some variables are more uh, relevant than others. So, for example, uh, here we counted how many units were uh, coupled to uh, different uh, behavioral variables. Okay, so uh, for example, if we look at this uh, left, right, and the body points, uh, they were only coupled to uh, very few units. Uh, instead, when we uh, look at this, so, in up down face and postures that uh, capture the, uh, the uh, uh, change in posture when the animal is looking up and down, then uh, those were a, a strong predictor. Uh, and the other strong predictor was uh, represented by full body movements, uh, typically uh, 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 The second thing. Uh, we, the second question that we asked was uh, how many uh, couplings can be expressed by uh, individual units? How many uh, different ways uh, single units can couple to uh, postures and movements? Uh, and through that, we uh, performed a, a relatively simple clustering analysis where we uh, uh, represent each unit as a, as a sort of 2D histogram where the mean firing rate is calculated as a function of the two uh, strongest predictors. So either these uh, up and down postures or uh, this overall level of uh, movement. And uh, what we find is uh, essentially two uh, groups of neurons um, that we sort of call uh, look up and look down units. Uh, look up neurons uh, tend to fire most uh, when the animal is, uh, is moving a lot. And when it is, is looking up, and uh, look down neurons tend to um, fire a lot when the animal is moving, but tends to be looking down. And instead, they, they are almost silent when they are looking up. Okay. Um, so far, all the uh, results I've been showing you uh, were obtained in complete darkness, so with no visual input. Then we uh, repeated all these experiments in, on the bright light. Uh, and uh, well, I don't have time to go through all the results again, but essentially, we were, were all uh, recapitulated. The only quantitative difference is that the coupling is actually stronger under bright light. Um, and the uh, important thing to, to show, though, is that this kind of behavioral tuning was uh, preserved under bright light. So here I show you the, uh, the cross correlation between firing rate. And, uh, and particular uh, behavioral variables measured either uh, in darkness or under bright light. And as you can see, the, the cross correlation is very, very uh, similar in these two conditions. Uh, and this is true uh, across uh, most of our uh, uh, data sets. So, to uh, summarize this uh, second part of the, uh, of the talk, uh, so I show you that. Um, uh, neurons in primary visual columns uh, are uh, coupled to um, uh, specific visual motor behaviors via these uh, look up and look down units. Uh, coupling is present in the dark and is also maintained and actually uh, amplified under the dark. Uh, 
And in this, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the people that uh, really work on this uh, project. So, uh, uh, Chang Fang uh, did all the uh, all the experiments for the first part of the book that I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, Patricia uh, and Chan is, is a PhD student. Uh, we draw the reference uh, with myself. Uh, and uh, Patricia was a fellow is um, uh, my fellow in Manchester. And uh, she worked with me to, um, to perform the experiments for the second part of the uh, talk that uh, I've shown you. Uh, and that's it. Yes. Something that we use machine learning to predict the fire phase, then the features that we use for the behavior are wise. Am I understand correctly? That's like the sheet from the points here. The distance in the beginning, the end of the movement. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but how do you describe what's uh, behavior while are? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, some of them uh, essentially were two types of variables. So one, uh, one type was measuring postures. So we, um, uh, what we do, what we did was to um, essentially do, um, once we have this 3D reconstruction of the animal, we superimpose all the forces in the data set, and we run an essentially principal component analysis to capture the direction of, uh, you know, head and body movements. Uh, and that was quite informative because actually the, the, the result you know, made a lot of sense. So uh, the principal component was this kind of body, sort of arch, body and head arch along the, uh, the, the, the main axis, then we have this kind of left and right, uh, and so on. Uh, the other, uh, so, so this was just the, uh, so, so some of these components are, some of these variables are essentially the, uh, the principal components. And then we added some more uh, sort of handcrafted postures like measuring the, the angle of the head as a, as a function of the uh, ground uh, or uh, as a, as a yeah, in, in relation to the ground and so on. Uh, then uh, we um, then we also measure the, the, the temporal validity of some of the variables. So those were the movements. And uh, at the top of it, we had the uh, locomotion, essentially by measuring how you know how fast the, the, the body center of the animal is moving on the uh, on the on the plane. And then we and, and, and then additional measure when we make when we sort of uh, uh, calculate the Euclidean distance between all the three D points in one frame and all the three D points in one frame. Yeah. So that was the sort of this overall uh, so. yeah. so so I can think of two reasons why these neurons might increase their firing rate. So particular particular behaviors happen. And, and they're not mutually exclusive. The neuron could be doing both. But, and one is to tell other neurons that this stuff is going on. But the other is to actually, it's symptomatic, it's changing its threshold and changing its sensitivity. And do you have any data indicating whether that's happening? No. <laughs> At the moment, you only showed correlations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. It could, it could just be that. Uh, uh, some form of game modulation, like uh, you've seen uh, in, uh, um, in other examples, or it could actually be something more uh, uh, sophisticated. Like, uh, and as you said, there are no mutually exclusive. But, but so, as game modulation, it might actually be exciting because it could be yes. that these neurons are sensing particular hues, tuned to particular hues. Which are very important for that particular sort of thing. Yes, I think that, that's one of the that's one of the ideas. So it, in a way, like you can think about the game modulation on, on a global scale. So I, yeah. uh, I'm more alert, so I uh, I have a game modulation across all my neurons. Uh, but you can think about the more sophisticated you know, uh, strategy by specific, depending on the specific task, then I, I modulate only 
those nodes that are relevant for particular tasks. So that's another one. But I think it's very exciting to be able to break down both the behavior and the, and the neural responses. So, yeah, yes. <laughs> I have a question about the, the first uh, project. Did you measure what the mice, like your lab mice, are experiencing in their cage? And if it's not like what they prefer, where does that difference come from? So in uh, in, the, in their home cage, yeah. Uh, no, that's a good question. I have no idea. Uh, I guess it's very different. So natural conditions, right? I mean, it usually be, it's actually yes. quite yes. dark <laughs> on the top. Yeah. yeah, no, it would be interesting to actually see how, because I mean, they are stuck. Yeah, okay. uh, so it might actually be different to depend on where it could be around. Um, it's, it's like light in, 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 in the, in the stabular is somewhere that is not controlled yeah. at all. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I was wondering uh, which inputs into the LDN do you think are causing this neural response uh, up and down? If it's coming from motor cortex or you think from some other in area? Uh, I have no idea. Um, what currently, and I think we, 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 we I think that's the one of the answer. We are looking into this which would be very direct. Uh, and we have more strong projection in the ventral part, but not now, also part of the engine. Uh, but that's one of the things we are looking at. But as you said, we could do many other things. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.